Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Hope everything is going well. Hope you had a good weekend as well. Everyone can hear me okay? Just a thumbs up will do. Yes, we can. Yes, all right. All right, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, yes, maybe one of us can pray. Kennedy, would you like to pray? I can pray, it's okay. Thank you. Heavenly Father Jehovah, we thank you for this new week that you've given to us, Father Jehovah. The Papa, we are sincerely very thankful. We don't take everything for granted, Father Jehovah. Ask for your mercy and favor to be upon our teacher, Mr. Paul, now that we are student, Father Jehovah. I pray against everything that's going to work against my teaching, you are to be defeated in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kennedy. All right, so uh, let's get into our class. You know, uh, yesterday as I was preparing, I just realized that we have to go a little faster uh, because we have the whole of First Corinthians and the whole of Second Corinthians. So what we do is we will uh, take up the important verses uh, from each chapter, and uh, yes, we will go through it uh, chapter verse by verse, but. Uh, we'll spend more time on the important, you know, uh, chap verses, uh, but we'll try to go quick uh, uh, so that you know we by the end of the semester we would have finished the entire portion. All right. So last week uh, we did the introduction, uh, not last week, but the week before that uh, we did the introduction, and then we also did. Uh, hold on. Uh, after the introduction, we did chapter one, verse one to seven. Let me see if I can just. Uh, Present the notes so that uh, okay. can all follow along here. All right. So we stopped at verse eight, uh, and we can begin from here. Right. Feel free to post your questions in between, uh, and we will also uh, try and answer those questions as well. Right. So First Corinthians was eight onwards. Who will also confirm you to the end? That you may be blameless in the day of the Lord. Now, Paul is writing uh, to the church in Corinthian, uh, to the Corinthians, and he's telling them that right now, you know, maybe in his mind he's thinking, right now, you know, there's so many things that are happening within the church, but there will come a time when you will be blameless in the day of the Lord. Right now, Jesus Christ will. You know, make firm or secure these believers so that they will be presented blameless in the day of the Lord. Now, the word blameless without any accus accusation, right? Now, look at the confidence that Paul is writing with. He's, he's, he's preparing to write to this local church several issues, division, strife, uh, and, and things are not going right, practical problems. And yet he's so confident that the Lord is going to work in them in such a manner that, you know, in the end, they will be present blameless. Now, it's so encouraging for us, right, as believers, you know, even as we walk this journey, we will make mistakes, right? And it's important to learn from our mistakes. But here's the thing. When we make a mistake, we must go back to God. We must be confident that we, because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can be secure and presented blameless in the day of the Lord. Right? Now, what is the uh, enemy's work? You know, the word Satan simply means accuser of the brethren, right? So his his work is to accuse. Uh, oh, how can you do this? Right? Uh, but Paul is really teaching us something very important here. And it's applicable to us now also, right? Uh, to be confident. That even in our failures, even when we have, you know, messed up, uh, we can always get back, and the Lord Jesus will present us blameless before the Father, right? Uh, now, if you if you follow this, you know, uh, we see uh, like this one sentence of thanksgiving, and from verses eight, four to eight, we see so many things that Paul is talking about, right? Verses four to eight, he says, in verse four, he's talking about grace. Verse 5 is enriching. Verse 6, the confirmation of the gospel. Verse 7, expression of the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, verse, sorry, verse 7, the anticipation of 
uh, Jesus' return and verse 8 being thankful for all these things that God has done in the lives of the believers. So we see that Paul has not yet gone to the main problem right, of, of, of what is happening in the church. But he's assuring them, he's telling the believers, see, these are the things that you have. These are the benefits, the blessings that you have. And this is what Jesus Christ did for each one of you. right? So it's so wonderful. Like, you know, he's not writing this letter just, you know, oh, I'm angry now. Oh, how can these things happen? And he's not just writing it out of anger or, or you know, uh, but he's trying to, you know, build a foundation for the believers. And he's telling them, look, it's all right. It's all right when things are not going right or when we, uh, you know, when we mess up. All of these is available for us. And so we can make things right. right? And then we look at the next chapter, how he, uh, you know, he, he tells the church. He comes to the problem. Right? He deals with the problem. It's not like he's, you know, just sweeping the dust uh, under the carpet and say, okay, it's okay because of God you have all this. No, uh, he does deal with the problem, but he's, you, you see the heart of a father here. He's saying, okay, it's all right. Uh, we deal with the problem, but this is who you are. Right? So it's so wonderful to read that. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right now, the Apostle Paul is confident that the Corinthian believers will be firm and secure because God is faithful. Right now, here's something interesting. Right, you've seen it. Uh, I've written it in blue there. Uh, Paul is not taking credit for you know the work of the ministry. He's not taking credit for himself. You know? He's not saying, "Okay, I." planted this church. I was the one who went to Corinth. I was the one who ministered. And now I'm taking credit. Like We don't see that. Right? He's saying, the Lord will be firm and secure because God is faithful to keep you firm and secure. Right? Uh, and here he uses the Greek word, which we all very commonly use, koinonia, which means communion, sharing, partnership, friendship, intimacy with Christ. Right, and he's he's basically stating, as believers, we are we have been called to have koinonia, which means communion, sharing, partnership. Now, don't you feel this is such a beautiful way of, you know, the church's problem was division. Now he's he's bringing the foundation. He's coming to the point. He's saying, hey, as believers, fellowship, koinonia. This is what we must have. And so, as a reader. I'm thinking, hey, you know, uh, I'm seeing so much division. So probably if I was in the Corinthian church sitting and they're reading this letter, the Holy Spirit will begin to talk to us, right? Saying, hey, I'm seeing one is, you know, Cephas, one is Paul, one is following the Lord Jesus, one is Apollos. And, uh, but here, you know, it's saying that we, have, we must have koinonia, which means partnership, sharing, friendship, intimacy with Christ. Right? Uh, and so here's the important part. Fellowship is always two ways. Right? Uh, fellowship is always two ways. So it's not something that uh, you know it just happens one way from one person. Right? If I have to have fellowship with somebody, I need to you know spend time with that person. Right? I need to you know, get to know the other person. And and so when we want to have koinonia or fellowship with the uh with each other and with God, with the Holy Spirit, it's a two-way relationship. Right? It, it's two ways. It's not something that only one person can work towards. Right? And we learn a lot about this in uh the Holy Spirit as well. Right? Uh so let's go to the next. Uh I'm going a little bit quick. Right, uh, so that we can just you know look to finish as much as possible, right? Uh, a call to unity. Now, you see here that Paul is trying to come to the problem, right? Now we know one of the uh, plenty of practical problems, but 
one of the main problems was also division. Right? So he's coming to the problem here. Right? He says in verse 10, uh, let's go to that verse. I just want to go verse by verse. So this is an important section. Now I plead to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there is no divisions among you, but you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Right? So from chapter one, verse for, for about nine verses, he's just encouraging them, right? And now he gets into the, the, the you know the heart of the problem. Uh, he says, the Apostle Paul makes the plea, makes this plea with the authority that the Lord Jesus gave him, right? Uh, and he's saying to them, right, what a local community of believers should strive for, right? Uh, and, and he's made there, uh, you know, a couple of uh, instructions he's giving. One, speak the same thing. Now, speak the same thing meaning doesn't, doesn't mean, uh, oh, you know, we all speak the same words, but our faith as people of god our our understanding our our vision must be the same thing right what does the bible say if people have uh, uh, if you if if there are there are two people if they're not in line you know they're not going to walk together right uh, but when you have the same understanding the same faith the same uh, you know uh, your steps are guided together so Paul is firstly saying, I want you as a church to have the same faith. Right? Two, no divisions. You know, uh, nothing should split us apart. Now Paul knows that there are divisions. Right? He's saying, as a church, you should not have divisions. Then he's saying, to be perfectly joined together. Right? Uh, now, uh, you get this, you know, this whole understanding of joined together uh, is to, you know, be made fit. Like it, it's like a puzzle, right? You've got these pieces of puzzle, uh, and unless every piece is put at the right place, the right shape is put at the right place, it's not going to form a perfect picture, right? Uh, and so it, it should be perfectly joined together. So when you look at a church, Paul is saying, it should be perfectly joined together, meaning everyone should, you know, complement each other and not compete with each other. Right? So if I have certain gifts and another person has, a, uh, you know, another gift, I am to complement. You know, so for example, I can, you know, probably have the prophetic gift. Right? So I say, God, in the church, help me to use the prophetic gift well. And so in the church, people know, and maybe there's somebody else. Who has the gift of working of healings and miracles now if i go through a sickness i should not come to a place where i say hey well no i'm a prophetic person so how can i go to this other person and ask for uh, prayer for healing what's going to happen there's there's no union there's no perfectly joined together feeling they're not complementing each other and so that's what paul is saying here right now remember this church was already flowing in the gifts. So this could be one of the things that is happening within the church. Right? Then he goes to say the same mind. You know, the, when you say the mind, he's referring to the faculties of perceiving, or, you know, judging or determining. So Paul is saying, okay, all of us are different people. We are all different individuals. We have our differences, we have our different perspectives, we have our opinions, our feelings, we understand things differently, right? But here's the thing, as children of Christ, as people in koinonia, in fellowship with one another, we have to make a choice to align ourselves together, right? It's not going to happen automatically. We have to make a choice. Okay, let me align myself with what is happening in the church. And when we do that, we are glorifying Jesus Christ and it strengthens the body of Christ. And, and that's so wonderful, right? It's so true also. I mean, we all have different temperaments, different perspectives, different opinions, feelings, 
different ideas, different strategies within the church. Right? Even uh, as a church, when we make decisions, we come together, we talk, uh, and we try to make decisions together. And we come up with all kinds of you know, plans and strategies. Uh, but in the end, we, we try to put them all together and you know, uh, come up with a good plan, which is beneficial for the church. Now, it's not like any of us will feel, hey, how come they didn't you know, even think, consider my opinion? No, because we are trying to do what's best for the body of Christ. And as leaders for the body of Christ, of the body of Christ, one of the things that we want to see is that the plan and the strategy should strengthen the body, strengthen the believers, and it should glorify Christ. That is what must happen. Right? And so this is so powerful. These few things that Paul is mentioning here, he's saying, speak the same thing, same faith. Don't say one, you know, one. if one group is saying, uh, I don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and then here there's another group saying, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, as a church, everything is so, you know, it, it, there'll be confusion. Now, don't say, no, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, there's division. Then he's saying, be perfectly joined together like a puzzle. Just complement each other, be there for each other. Have the same mind, you know, our understandings, May be different, we are different individuals, but we have to align our understanding to the will of God. Right? Have the same view, see, have the same opinion. Uh, and so wonderfully, Paul is bringing out the meaning here. Let's go from verse 11 to through 16. Right? Uh, please feel free to stop me, right? If you have any questions, if you want me to repeat anything also, please feel free to stop, right? Okay. Verse 11 through 16. Here he comes to the matter now. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Right. So here he's coming to this whole problem here. What is causing divisions and quarrels among the Corinthian believers? Now, we did in the introduction, we talked about Apollos and how uh, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, you know, taught uh, uh, Apollos about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was a wonderful orator, very learned man. He went to Corinth and he began to minister at Corinth. Right? And so now, Paul they know because he's the leader. They know Peter because he's again a leader in the Jewish community and everyone know Peter. And then there's Apollos. Right? Now, thankfully, there's no uh, Aquila and Priscilla even though they were there. Because they were, Aquila and Priscilla were there only for a you know, uh, for a very short term, so uh, right. So th they probably didn't mention them. But here there are three people: Paul, Peter, and Apollos. Now some are saying, "Hey, you know what? When Apostle Paul came, you know, he said this." And then the Jews probably are saying, "But Peter, he's talking to the Jewish church." And you know the, the church in Jerusalem, and he's talking about this. And what do you think about this? This is what Peter has been teaching. And then another group is saying, "Hey, Apollos was the best. You know, he the way he spoke, the way he ministered. You know, so now you've got three leaders. All three of them have one intention to build the body of Christ. But the people, the congregation, the believers have completely turned it around. So, hey, Paul." He's a pioneer. Hey, no, Peter, because he's he was with Jesus. He's seen Jesus. Paul is talking about, you know, he's not seen him. Or, or Apollos, he's talking, you know, from his wonderful intellect. And so there's divisions. But this became a big problem. Imagine a church that's divided. It's not going to stand strong. It's so important, right? Uh, there's, there's no way. Uh, a house divided in itself cannot stand. Right? Even if you look at a house with four people, 
right? Imagine the husband is saying something, the wife is saying something, and the probably uh, uh, two adult children in the house, adult youth in the house, and they are, one is the youth, one is saying another thing, one is saying another thing. All four are divided. I mean, they all love each other, they all care for each other, but their opinions and thoughts are all divided. One thinks yoga is good, one thinks there is no God, one says there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, matter, and one thinks, you know, Jesus is the true God. You've got four thoughts in one house, that house is not going to stand for long. Right? Now, it's a very important lesson to learn for each of us. No matter how many leaders come and go, it's wonderful. We have to learn from their lives. But you and I must base our identity in Christ. Jesus is our model, right? The moment Jesus is our model, yes, we look at people, we learn from people, right? We learn from their lives, we are encouraged, we gain faith. But our model is Jesus. Hey, one day I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be like this person, but I want to be like Jesus. Maybe I want to achieve what this person has done, right? Or I want to achieve what this pastor or this worship leader has done or this minister of God has done. I would love to achieve it, but I want my identity to be based from Jesus Christ, right? He has called each one of us. He has raised each one of us to serve him, right? So. Each church, each leader, each ministry, it, it's very different, right? God gives grace to each of them in different ways, right? There are some churches where the pastors, they have certain gifts and they flow in it so beautifully because of the grace of God, right? There are some, you know, you know believers who, who have their own, you know, calling, their own identity, and it's, it's so wonderful. But... Our identity is not from our leaders. My identity is not that I'm, you know, pastor at APC. It is one of the roles that the Lord has called me to fulfill, and I'm happy, more than happy, to fulfill that role. But what if I'm not a pastor? Will my identity be the same? Or will I feel, hey, nobody's calling me pastor? Will things change? Could be. So why? That means my identity has been on this pastoral, you know, calling or the I or my, you know, my uh, identity is in that status of being called a pastor. But if my identity is in Christ and not in a ministry, then it doesn't matter whether I'm on the pulpit, whether I'm not on the pulpit, whether I'm preaching or not preaching. My identity remains strong. Hey, one day I want to be like Jesus. So very important lesson for each of us to learn. Right? It's good to look at individuals, look at great leaders, but let us keep Jesus as our model. Right? Let us keep Jesus as our model. Now we, we must also be careful not to, you know, uh, put down anyone. Right? So there may be people. Who are our friends or believers who are saying, "Hey, have you listened to this sermon by this pastor?" Don't say, "Hey, who's, um, no, who's this pastor or who's this person?" You know, I want to be like Jesus. No, God has placed them so that yeah, uh, they they've done wonderful things for God. We learn from their lives. But when you hear a sermon, when you hear uh, or the word of God, say, "God, help me to be more like you." Right, and that's so wonderful. And he goes on here in verse 17, he says that what really matters, right? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made effect. Now, Paul is saying, this is so wonderful. He's saying, now, this church is good. Yes, there are divisions among the church. And it's good to see that, you know, there are leaders in the church, baptism, all these things are good. But what really matters is the gospel. Because the gospel is the message of the cross. And without the cross, there is no gospel. 
without the gospel there is no believers without the believers there is no church right so he's trying to bring our attention to the main aspect of ministry why is the corinthian church meeting and why are you all meeting together because of the gospel because of the cross of jesus christ and later on he says did paul oh, was paul crucified uh, he tries to bring that point as well so it's a cross it's not because we have free time and we are meeting it's the cross it's not because we are wonderful people called you know to you know we have asked for forgiveness and now we are good people no it's because of the cross right now we preach the gospel as clearly as we can you know and the apostle paul did it so wonderfully we see that in uh, you know in athens he's he preached the gospel so wonderfully now this crowd was a crowd in greece known for its wisdom right but paul is saying here we must not depend on our wisdom our intellect or our eloquence now paul was a learned man but he could have depended on his intellect he could have depended on his eloquence of speech he could have said hey you know what we don't see that right in the whole of that whole encounter in the book of acts when he's at corinth and athens he's preaching we don't see he doesn't say oh you know first let me give you a background of who i am i was a young man i was in judaism i studied under gamaliel i was you know i know everything about judaism and i was a commander i'm a hebrew of the hebrews of a tribe of benjamin i'm a commander of the temple guard and I've, i've got all these credentials so now i want to tell you something he didn't start off that way so that they, you know they say oh this man is a, a intellectual man let us listen no all he said was i see that you have these statues which says there is no uh, to an unknown god let me make known to who that god is we can stretch the gospel right and and all his credentials didn't matter at all to him you know it's so powerful right for us also to learn this right that our credentials is not what will you know bring a change in people's lives the holy spirit will work through the message of the gospel and then he goes on verse 18 to 25 uh let's read from verse 21 right i just want to uh, uh and we know that from verse 21 yeah he says for sins in the wisdom of god the world through wisdom did not know god it pleased god through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe for the jews request a sign and greeks seek after wisdom but we preach christ crucified to the jews a stumbling block and to the greeks foolishness right now let's look at this right so wonderfully he writes here for since in the wisdom of god was to anyone the world through wisdom did not know god now we see two kinds of wisdom here right one is the worldly wisdom with the wisdom of the natural man his own wisdom and then there's the wisdom of god there is a difference right he we can make out the difference here man has his own wisdom but through that wisdom you cannot comprehend and understand god now look let's look at these wonderful you know very learned people right there are you know all these intellectuals highly knowledgeable very influential very you know uh, accomplished in life have great wisdom they've done wonderful things in business and now if you tell them about god they'll say hey there is no god or i don't believe god or they probably are believing in something that is you know uh, 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 you know another faith idol worshiping right? i remember this man now a young guy one of my friends very very intellectual guy right? he would read and read prolific reader full of wisdom 
right? uh, when he talks you can you know you can just see that you know uh, he has so much of wisdom when he talks many times i try to share the gospel with him you know what does he say he says how can there be a god how can there be a god that can create all this in you know in a couple of days or, or how can it be and that day i thought to myself you know this young man he has so much of wisdom but it's all earthly wisdom it's a natural wisdom it's not going to he cannot comprehend the things of god when i told him about jesus you know jesus uh, god sent his son in his natural wisdom cannot comprehend it it does not make sense right so spiritual things cannot be understood with the natural mind but only with the help of the holy spirit right so here's a encouragement for us we can share the gospel to people that's wonderful right and only the holy spirit can work in their lives because our, our natural wisdom and our natural you know apologetics can only bring us to a certain place but the work of the holy spirit is the only one who can change a person's heart right so paul is saying hey when i went to paul has been everywhere he went to galatia first right and he knows the jews he was sharing with the jews they said get out we don't want you we don't want you to you know tell us anything about this so here first he's saying there's a natural wisdom there's a heavenly wisdom natural wisdom you cannot comprehend the things of god but the wisdom of the holy spirit will help us to comprehend and understand the things of god and it pleased god through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe you know the first time i read this i thought why is paul saying foolishness of preaching right it's not foolish to preach right? is it foolish to preach is it, uh, uh, and, and i thought his words were a little bit harsh but it's it's true right all we have to do is preach this message of the cross to those who have to to those who believe Right? that's all we have to do jesus you know came into this world jesus was god he came into this world born of a virgin he lived a perfect life died on the cross he rose again from the dead he defeated the enemy and we believe in him we have forgiveness of sins the simple gospel you preach this now it looks sometimes you know it looked like we are fools right people may mock us ridicule us right look many a times i felt like a fool i felt felt so uh, you know sometimes humiliated felt so weak when you have a crowd of people just saying you know doesn't make sense and you got some intellectuals trying to you know do that whole debate with you and you know they pull out quotes from all these other people and sometimes i felt so foolish but this is a wonderful reminder the things the natural mind cannot comprehend the things of god god has chosen this method of preaching the gospel not by our own works right because the moment we stop our works salvation will stop right so if it's our if it's by what jesus did it is it is complete uh and so each one of us right, even as paul is telling the church here he must apply it to ourselves right uh, and we learned a lot of this in uh lifestyle evangelism as well let's go to the next portion 22 to 24 this is interesting for the jews request a sign and the greeks seek after wisdom but we preach christ crucified to the jews it's a stumbling block to the greeks it's foolishness now the Jews were spiritual people, right? They were looking for supernatural signs and manifestations. Uh, you know, if you read the book of John, you see that all through, I think we are, you're also studying John and John 1, 2, and 3. It's, it's really interesting, the book of John, right? He, Jesus keeps mentioning that, you know, they all followed him and he knew what's in their heart. He knew that they were following him for the miracles. And what's the proof? The proof is he was on the mountain there were 10,000 people 
There were 5,000 people. Thousands of people were following him. Right? What did they want? They wanted miracles. Right? They wanted to see, oh, this, this great prophet, you know, whenever he, you know, the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the, he, hey, I was eyewitness, five loaves of bread and two fish, he broke it, gave thousands of people. How is he able to do this? So people were following him. But the moment he died, where were the thousands? Nobody was there. Only 120 people are there, sitting in the upper room. All the thousands said, okay, this man has gone. No more signs. If he was really what who he said he was, Messiah, he would have come down from the cross. No, he didn't come down. It became a stumbling block. They could not accept the fact that Jesus, if he was the Messiah, you know, to die on a cross is a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of power. There's too much for them to understand and to take. How can a Messiah die a death on a Roman cross? It's not possible. It becomes a stumbling block. Now the Greeks were interested in things that appeal to the mind. Right? Now Jesus came, he lived a life, he died on the cross, he rose again, and now he defeated death. It doesn't sound interesting at all. Where is he? He's there somewhere in the heavens. No, it doesn't sound interesting. But it sounds foolish. Uh, okay, so but you know what? God sent his Holy Spirit to come and uh, uh, reside in you, and it's like Jesus staying in you. Where's the Holy Spirit? I, I, I don't see the Holy Spirit. Now the Greeks are going to say, yes, you're talking foolish things. And that's exactly the response what the Apostle Paul received. Some said, okay, you come back, you're talking some interesting things. I mean, we have some questions. You come back and you talk to us. But the other said, rid the earth of this guy. Get rid of him. He's talking nonsense. What do we see here? One, you have people who want miracles. Two, there are people who want understanding. Paul is saying to, to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. But it does not matter because when I came to you, I preached the gospel, the message of the cross, and you believed. So it is only the cross that can change you. It is only the work of the Holy Spirit through the gospel message of the cross that can change a person's life. Verse 25, he ends that by saying, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. And so, you know, it is so interesting to think of this. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. We may have the wisest man on the earth, right? Even if God, even if God can be foolish, the foolishness of God also is wiser than that, right? And come to think of it, it's like uh, you know, Paul is trying to uh, really bring a point across, saying that hey, on our own efforts, nothing can be achieved. On our own, we may think we are wise, but we are not. Even the foolishness of God is wiser than our best, wisest moment. So Paul is saying, you have confidence in this, in the gospel, the message of the cross, the power of God, as the wisdom of God. And when you're preaching it, preach it boldly, preach it unashamedly. Right? Because the message has the power of God, and it's the wisdom of God. Now, you may think it's foolish, but the foolishness of God is better, is wiser than you know, your wisdom, the earthly wisdom. Right? So we see here that Paul is really trying to make the church understand who they are, their identity, understand you know, the power of the gospel, that they've not been saved by any miracles, or they've not been saved by any preacher who came. Yes, God used Paul as a tool. But it's not because of that. They are saved because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? And, and this is so encouraging for us. Right? 
wherever we go, we can preach the gospel and know that, hey, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God. It's the wisdom of God. Right? Right. Any questions? Any thoughts you, anybody has? I know I've been talking. Uh, any questions? Shall we just go ahead, continue? Okay. Okay, let's go ahead, right? Verse 26 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, Paul is bringing out something here, another aspect. He's trying to make the believers understand the calling. God does not call each of you because of your earthly accomplishments. Now, Corinthian church is a mixed crowd. Now, we must remember all the Gentile churches, right, were a mixed congregation. There would have been a couple, you know, a few Jews, but mostly uh, they were Gentile believers, right? Now, for example, Corinth, which is in Greece, there would have been many learned people with many uh, accomplishments. Uh, you know, they may have been very wise in their thoughts, and uh, you know, even even Paul says, you know, the whole point of this whole division, you know, Paul, Peter, Paul, was, we were accomplished people, right? They they did a great work in God's kingdom, uh, and God used them mightily. But here, Paul is trying to say, it is not not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So it's not about our earthly accomplishments. Now, I want to be very careful because, you know, sometimes it, people take this and use it in a wrong context. Right? For example, uh, you know, there are people who, young people that I meet now, hey, but God does not call the qualified. No? It's true, but that does not mean we don't, be, we don't, you know, one of the examples they use is, hey, Peter was just a fisherman. But he did so great things. So, you know, I also don't want to study much, but I want to do something for God's kingdom. Now, that would be the wrong approach to take. Why? Because God has also called us to, you know, to learn, to equip ourselves. Work is God's original design. Studying, empowering ourselves, it's, it's, it's what God wants us to do. Now, Paul was a learned man. Right? Now, if you look at... Uh, uh, the other disciples, yes, there were people who were not learned, but there were people who were learned also. Right? God chose people who were, you know, uh, who had accomplishments and people who didn't have accomplishments. Now, it does not mean that I, I, I say I do, I should not, you know, spend too much time on all these, you know, getting a, a degree and getting a master's. Uh, we have to do God's work. No. Yes, God's work is important, but God also expects us to learn and develop and grow, uh, uh, you know, build ourselves. Right? There's nothing wrong in, you know, taking speaking classes. You know, I, I know a couple of my friends who are who are taking speaking classes. Right? They go for classes for, uh, you know, to uh, remove stage fear and how to speak. And that's wonderful. Now, is it that they, uh, is it that they want to, you know, to accomplish good things in life, yes, but they're also good believers. They want to use that for the ministry as well. They want to learn how to, you know, reach out, how to minister to people. So God works in a way that He takes the weak, He reveals His power, His wisdom to them, and He releases the work of God in their lives. He works with the weak, with the foolish, with the, with the unvalued, with the despised. And he's willing to reveal his work through them. But he also uses the intellectual, the famous, the rich, uses them to do the things of God. Right? So why does he do this? He does this because none of us can glory in ourselves. None of us can say, because of me, this person has become a believer. No. 
don't say it is because of God. Now, I've written down a couple of examples there. Do you know, I'm sure you may have known, you know, Ravi Zacharias who wanted to commit suicide after his failure in his studies. But after he gave his life to Christ, who would have known, right, that he would have come up with, you know, I've read a lot of his books and I have to read it at least two, three times to understand it. The words that, who would have known this, God would have used this young Indian boy from a small town who wanted to commit suicide, he took this guy because of failure in studies and made him a world-renowned evangelist writing, uh, writing these wonderful books with such high uh, grammar and understanding. Who would have known? Fanny Crosby in the uh, church history was a blind young girl and uh, all she wanted to do was to, you know, write songs, but she, you know, she, she had this whole thing of, I'm very weak, blind, tiny girl, right? So what happens? God uses Fanny Crosby in such a powerful way. She's the first woman in, in church history we study. She was the first woman to sit in a court proceeding, right? And she's written about 8,000 hymns. To God, one blind girl. Even now we sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Hundreds of years later, we are still singing her songs. What about Billy Graham? He was a very, very shy boy when he was, you know, he, he would not talk to people. Who would have known God would have used to take him and put him as an evangelist with thousands of people? He has to preach in front of thousands of people. He's very shy in his school. So, why am I giving these examples? Because with our own, you know, strength, with our own abilities, God is able to take that weakness that we have and make it His strength. That's only the work of God. Moses was stuttering and stammering, made him the leader to speak to so many people, and he said, "No, no, I don't want to speak. Can somebody else speak?" Okay. Then God said, "Okay, Aaron, you speak for him." Right. So. This brings hope for each of us, right? Uh, God will work in our, each of our lives. He will be willing to display His wisdom, His power. And when He does that, we have to glorify Him. Now, whatever we have achieved, say, God, it is because of you. He's able to take, you know, that's the uniqueness of Christ. He takes our weakness and makes it our strength. Uh, maybe if it's public speaking, some of you may feel, hey, I'm not good at public speaking. God is able to take that weakness and make it a strength. Some of you may feel, I'm good in studies. I'm, whatever I study, I don't remember. I can't understand. Because you can make, take that weakness, make it as a strength. You know, I hated in school. I hated books. Uh, you know, I would always wonder why you should be read. And then even after I became a believer, I, I, I didn't have this thing of reading. I can't read. It was something I had an aversion to. I didn't want to read. I went through the through school and through college, uh, anything other than reading. Right. But then there came a time after I became a believer, I said, God, for me to, be, to understand the scriptures, I have to read it. No, I can't keep listening to sermons. That's good. But I have to read it for me to understand, to grow in it. Help me. Then I slowly began to read books. And so now I'm not boasting that I can read. You know, I use a lot of examples. It's all from books that I've read. Right? Uh, and I love reading books now. You know, uh, I, I just look out for any book. I've been reading uh, Andrew Womack's Find, Fulfill, and uh, Follow. It's a wonderful book. Right? And, and I'm learning so much. And now I can't stay without reading. Is it a work that, that I have done? You look at the Paul of <laughs> the four. I hated books, but God takes that weakness and makes it astral. So each one of us, we, we have a weakness, right? Don't let that weakness bring you down. It may be even parenting. Even now, I I pray. I say, God, help me to uh, two small kids. Help me to be good parent. Help me teach me. Right? Uh, I I don't know. I've not gone for any parenting classes and all that. I would love to, love to read about, I do read about parenting, but teach me, right? 
this is a weakness I may have. You teach me. At verse 30, and we'll take a break. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom of God and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. All that happens is because of what God himself has done for us in Christ Jesus. Now, God has made Christ to be for us wisdom, righteousness. God is our wisdom. God is our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. Right. So all that we glorify in, we must glorify Christ. So in conclusion to this chapter, we should not boast in men, not in Paul, not in Apollos, not in Peter, not in any of the preachers that are there during our time. We learn from them. But our message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. So let's take a break. Come back at 10. And uh, we'll continue from where we stop. We'll go to chapter 2 onwards. Right. All right. Let's take a break. Thank you.